Okay, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, and uh, thank you, Chairman, for that introduction. And uh, so, in this tutorial, I'm going to cover uh, two main topics, um, as highlighted over there: uh, entropy generation circuits and also circuits uh, to enable secure encryption. Right, these two things are uh, kind of the foundations of uh, of guaranteeing that we can. Uh, um, share data uh, in a secure manner uh, between platforms and also crunch on data in a secure manner while uh, data is residing on, on a platform. All right, so in the first part, I'll uh, focus on uh, entropy generation circuits. And uh, here I'll talk about uh, two types of entropy. Uh, one is called uh, static entropy, and uh, the second thing is dynamic entropy. And uh, today, what we what we have in uh, products out in the market is we have separate circuits to generate both static entropy and uh, dynamic entropy. And uh, what I'll talk about is some of our research uh, in, in Intel Labs, uh, basically coming up with a single uh, IP, a single circuit that can generate both static and dynamic entropy and there are all sorts of uh, advantages with using a single set of IP rather than having uh, two uh, sets of IP to generate static and dynamic entropy. Right, so the first thing I'll talk about is uh, static entropy. Uh, static entropy is the kind of entropy where uh, we have a, a random ID that is um, unique to every die out there in the field, right? So it's, it's random in the sense that every ID, every die uh, in the market has a, a different ID and that ID is totally random with respect to any other ID that's on another die, right? So it's uh, so there's entropy in in space, not in time, right? So every time that power part uh, that part powers up, we want to get that same random number for the lifetime of the die, right? So even if so, if the die is alive for say seven years out in the field, every in that seven years, every time it boots up, you should get that same random number. But if another die out there uh, is powered up, it should generate another random number, and that random number should be stable for the lifetime of the die. Okay, so it's it's random in space, not in time. We don't want that random number to change with time. Right? Today, what we do is um, we generate this random value, and we explicit program explicitly program this ID uh, onto uh, some one-time programmable fuses. Right? So. Um, now, the problem with that is it works great, but that value is physically present on the die. And also, uh, so it's out there for anybody to reverse engineer and grab that value. And another thing is, as a manufacturer, Intel will have to guarantee to our customers saying that, uh, trust us, we're not keeping track of this ID and we don't uh, store this ID anywhere. On the other hand, a technique, a, a circuit like a physically unclonable function, uh, uh, it takes advantage of some intrinsic physical identity that is uh, present in the in, in the uh, devices themselves to generate this ID uh, um, every time it's powered up. Right. So so this is called uh, so this is achieved using this physically unclonable function and the physical identity that we uh, the physical phenomenon that we tap in is uh, random process variation. So the basic idea is uh, the puff circuit is designed. Uh, um, it is designed once and it is put on every die out there. So it's designed to be identical on every die, but because of process variations, there's going to be some variation, uh, a, a transistor drawn on one device is not going to be the same as, on one die is not going to be the same as the one on another die out there. And if, if we have circuits that can measure or sample this random variation, and this random variation is uh, static with time, if you ignore aging and other effects in an ideal world, uh, it's uh, it, it's uh, it's baked in when the part is manufactured, and then when the part is powered on, somehow we transform this uh, random radiation um, into uh, a digital number, right? So there are any number of ways we can do this. Uh, people have published this uh, uh, all the way, you know, over the past ten years. There's been tons of pop, uh, publications. Uh, so it, you can use, uh, for example, uh, SRAM cells and use the power up state of SRAM cells, where so when an SRAM array is powered up and just uh, and woken up, all the bit cells over there are going to snap to a zero or to a one. And which way they snap will depend on, you know, the relative mismatches between the 
the devices in that uh, 60 S band cell. Um, you can use uh, ring oscillators. Uh, these ring oscillators, so if you have an array of these ring oscillators, they're all designed identically. You just stamp them out n number of times. Uh, now, if you can um, at random pick any of these, uh, a pair of these oscillators and compare the the, the oscillating frequency uh, of, of these ring oscillators, and there's, there's going to be slight mismatches between these oscillating frequencies. You can use simple digital counters to track how much the mismatch is, and uh, depending on uh, which one is, uh, is is great, you know, the the delta between the two, we can convert that to a zero or a one value using a simple comparator. There's also metastability-based uh, um, techniques where you take a bistable element, uh, put it into a metastable state, and then uh, let uh, process variation uh, push it out of uh, metastability and get snapped to a zero or one. And uh, that's another way of converting this random variation to a zero or a one value, right? So think of uh, it as this is uh, the circuit on the right is uh, the circuit that we need to generate one random bit. And if we stamp this out, say, 128 times, now you have a 128 bit random number. So the basic idea behind these physically unclonable function circuits is that um, we design these circuit to be perfectly balanced and perfectly matched at design time. And uh, when you manufacture these, uh, now these devices will be typically sized so that they are minimum sized devices that are subject to maximum variation from the process. Um, and so when you when you actually manufacture these out, um, the, the every circuit instance on every die is going to look a little different because of all sorts of uh, random doping fluctuations, uh, mask related issues and stuff like that. And uh, so that is where the, the entropy comes in. So um, here the goal would be that you, since you want stability, you want this number to be the same for the lifetime of the die every time you power it up. So transient phenomenon, things like um, random um, thermal noise or any other um, you know, voltage fluctuations or even temperature uh, variations or aging for that matter, those are time variant um, phenomenon. Those are things that can disrupt this random value, right? So you want, so we want typically when we design these things, we we put in techniques to suppress these uh, device noise, right? Um, on the other hand, we want to amplify process variation. What about, so for that reason, we use minimum size devices and we, we lay these out using analog circuit techniques uh, that, uh, um, that, that basically take out all the systematic variation out of the picture. And uh, finally, what you end up with is the random variation that the process gives you. Okay, so the, the design approach over here would be to suppress device noise, the time variant thing, and amplify the time invariant randomness. Now on the other side of the, uh, of the picture, we have uh, two random number generators, TR and Gs. Here, uh, we are talking about a different type of entropy. Uh, this this entropy is the kind of entropy that uh, you would use uh, that uh, a server would, for example, use every time a uh, SSL connection is being established. You want a fresh random number that is totally uncorrelated to the random number that you used in your previous uh, session setup. Um, so you want randomness, but randomness that changes with time, right? So if we uh, in mil uh, every, a million times, if we ask the random number generator to give us a random number, those million random numbers should have no correlation between them. So they should be they should be totally time variant, right? So we don't want any kind of correlation in in time. So here, anything that brings in uh, any predict predictability uh, needs to go out the window. So you want to suppress process variation. And you want to amplify things like uh, device noise because that's where the randomness comes from. Uh, a lot of these uh, random number generators are based on thermal noise. So you typically employ circuit techniques that uh, amplify uh, thermal noise and uh, suppress uh, process variation. So it's the exact opposite of what you want to do when you are when you are manufacturing uh, puffs. So puffs and uh, uh, TRNGs are uh, uh, two, uh, you know, uh, you know, you use uh, they're kind of uh, uh, 
they, 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 they require design constraints that fight against each other. So typically you have separate IP and you use different types of circuits to design TRNGs and paths. So um, the, the most classical uh, TRNG would be based on analog amplification where you know you 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 uh, you sample uh, thermal noise from a resistor and then you amplify it and then um, uh, con uh, take it through an ADC to convert it to a digital bit stream. There are other metastability based uh, um, uh, TRNGs also where again a bistable element is taken and uh, you need to calibrate out all the process variation and perfectly balance out this uh, uh, this bistable element such that now thermal noise is the only thing that impacts these things. Again, there are ring oscillator based techniques, uh, there are oxide uh, soft breakdown based techniques and so on. Main point over here is the design approach would be to amplify the time variant device noise while suppressing uh, process variation. All right, so, uh, so today what we do is we have separate IP to do these things. So that's uh, twice the design effort. Uh, these are uh, custom circuits. So it requires uh, separate design teams to, uh, to design these things. That's a lot of effort. It takes up uh, twice the amount of area on the die and uh, so twice the amount of power and so on. Now, what kind of applications do we use them for? It's uh, TRNGs is pretty obvious as I mentioned. Whenever you want to encrypt any uh, um, any SSH or any uh, um, secure uh, file transfer, you want a fresh key, and uh, so you you ask the TRNG to give you a random number, right? So you want a random number that's changing in time. Whereas a puff circuit would be something that is unique. You you can use them for all sorts of things. You can use them as a, a digital ID, um, identifying a user or a platform. Uh, you can use a that uh, that uh, pop value to generate a set of encryption keys that are unique to a particular platform and so on. So there's good motivation to to have both of them on a die at the same time. So what what we did was uh, uh, so we, we kind of stumbled on this. Uh, it it uh, ended up with uh, we were trying to really build a good path cell, right? So the path cell that we uh, that we came up with was uh, based on, it looks very much like an SRAM cell. It's based on this cross-coupled inverter, which is like any other memory cell. You see them, these in SRAMs, you see them in register files um, or flip-flops for that matter. Um, it's, it's, it's a cross-coupled inverter pair, right? Here what we do is um, we use this pair of uh, pre-charged transistors. Um, you ignore the, the input inverters over here. These two precharged transistors are clogged with uh, the input clock, right? So when the clock goes low, uh, both clock zero and clock one are both low, which means these two precharged transistors are turned on, which means now bit and bit bar are both at VCC. Now, when the clock is low, there's also a footer device over here. Since both bit and bit bar are at VCC, there will typically be a um, uh, short circuit current through these uh, through this cross couple pair that will prevent bit and bit path from going all the way to ECC. So we have a footer device over here to cut off that um, shoot through current. So bit and bit path are going to be at ECC, and the moment. So if you look at the butterfly curve of this cell, um, it's going to we are going to bias it at the top right corner where bit and bit path are both at ECC. Now the moment clock goes high what will happen is that will go through these two inverters. So clock zero and clock one is going to see a rising edge, which means both these pre-charged transistors are going to release. And at that point, bit and bit power are free to go wherever they want to go, right? Now, what will happen, what will end up happening is either bit will go, will stay at BCC and bit power will go towards ground or the other way around, right? Bit will head, head south and bit power will stay at BCC. Based on that, you're going to have um, either a one or a zero produced from the cell. Now, which one goes to VCC and which one goes to VSS will depend on what these butterfly curves look like. Now, uh, keep in mind that there are, uh, as this comes out of metastability, or really it's a really unstable point that, you, that we are forcing it into during pre-charge, and when the clock goes high, depending on the VT, how the VTs of all these devices um, work out, 
the device strengths of these uh, uh, of these inverters uh, they are all going to fight with each other right there are a lot of things that come into play over here it's not just the vts of the inverters it's also the the rise times of clock 0 and clock 1 which will depend on the strength of the devices in the inverters and actually you know even on the strength of these precharged transistors so there are a total of around um, 12 devices over here that come into play and they're all going to fight with each other and they're going to result in a butterfly curve that looks like uh, the one on the top where there is a propensity towards uh, going towards a zero where bit will be zero uh, or you could have a butterfly curve like this where the bit goes towards a one okay so if you have a curve that goes like this, this uh, puff cell is going to consistently produce a zero. If it's like this, it's going to consistently produce a one. So this is where random variation comes in. So random variation is going to give you a butterfly curve that looks like that or looks like that. Now these are good puff cells. You know they're stable. There's you know these two butterfly curves are there is a clear mismatch, and so you're now going to get predictable behavior out of this. Right? But it's not predictable in space. So another cell, another die, you're going to have some of them behaving like this, this is this, and, and so on. So that's where the randomness come in. So on the other hand, you can also have the situation where, um, as I said, there are uh, around uh, 12 devices over here that are all fighting with each other. Um, and what, what will happen is sometimes you will have all these mismatches perfectly cancel each other out. Right? Now that's uh, it's going to be a really low percentage of cells, but but it's uh, but a finite number of cells are going to behave like this. Uh, they're going to cancel each other out, and you have a butterfly curve that looks pretty balanced. Now these are bad puff cells because as your operating point moves from the unstable point, it doesn't know whether it needs to go to the top uh, top left or to the bottom right. So what's going to happen is on every clock edge, sometimes you'll go towards a one. Sometimes it'll go towards a zero. Now that's a, a bad puff cell. It's an unstable puff cell. And we do a lot of things to avoid the situation where we have a butterfly curve that's perfectly balanced when we're designing puff cells. Right? There's a lot of post-processing that we need to do to weed out these cells. One, to identify these cells. So if we have a puff array, which is uh, say a 1K puff array, uh, to identify which one of these puff cells are good puff cells, and make sure that those are the ones we use for generating the puff value. And, and we need to also make sure that we identify which are the bad puff cells and make sure that they are out of the picture. So we spend a lot of energy uh, doing these things. And uh, finally, we, uh, we weed them out and then we make sure that only good puff cells are used in the final value. So now here, the, the idea was that no matter what we did, um, Whenever we build a puff array, you're always going to have some puff cells that look like a, a, a bad puff cell. So the question was, instead of uh, you know wasting all this energy and uh, and performance trying to weed out these bad puff cells, can we do something useful with them? And the most obvious thing that we can do with them is uh, you know can we use them as a TRNG cell? Because these cells are bad puff cells, but they are good TRNG cells because you get this transient. Um, you get this dynamic entropy out of them. Every cycle, you are effectively, if your butterfly cell uh, curves are perfectly balanced, really what you're doing is you're sampling thermal noise, a differential thermal noise on bit and bit bar, and you're converting that to a one or a zero value. So this is the foundation of a of a TRNG uh, cell, right? So so that is what we thought we can explore. Okay, use the puff cells. You know, instead of forcing all puff cells to behave like puff cells. Let the puff cells that want to be puff cells be used as puff cells, and let the TRNG cells that want that want to behave like TRNG cells be used as TRNG cells. Right? So pretty simple, uh, but uh, there's a uh, turns out that it's more complicated than that. Right? So if we um, so now the question is how do we identify these things? Right? How do we identify which cells are potentially good TRNG cells? Right? So what we did is uh, we built a 512-bit puff array, and we measured, we read this puff array out, say, uh, 75,000 times. Now, it's pretty easy to do this because, as I mentioned, there's a clock coming in. 
So in 75,000 clock cycles, we can generate uh, 75,000 snapshots of what this puff value is. And then this, this curve here on the left uh, shows uh, what percentage of these cells have a probability of producing a zero value that's, uh, that's somewhere close to 49%. And what percentage of them have a probability of producing a one value, which again is around 49% of them. And then you have a whole bunch of cells that have some probability of producing a one, which is anywhere between zero and 100%. Right? So they represent the bad puff cells. Right? They, are, they are cells that don't consistently produce either a zero or a one. Sometimes they go towards a zero, sometimes they go towards a one. And uh, so what I've shown over here is one snapshot of this, um, where you can see the speckle pattern over here, where uh, these are 14 nanometer uh, measurements. And uh, this is what a puff array output looks like. Right, so now we take this curve. So this is a typical, you know, bathtub curve that you'll see in uh, any puff literature. And typically what we do is, uh, you only want to use the cells that are on the extremes of this bathtub because they are the good puff bits that consistently produce a zero or consistently produce a one. Now, everything else is thrown away in some sense. Now, our intuition over here was, you know, these cells which are biased right in the middle, you know, they have a 50% probability of producing a zero or a one. Now, they are potentially good TRNG bits, so why not? Harness those the entropy coming out of those bits and use them as as a, a TRNG uh, a, as a TRNG a two random number generator, right? And how do you do this? Uh, it's pretty simple. All we are doing is counting, looking at a window and counting what ratios of zeros and ones is uh, um, are, are being produced from each one of these puff bits, right? So if I use a digital counter and I counted these. Um, at the puff array, say 64 times using 64 clock ticks. And if I use the puff value as the enable into this counter, at the end of 64 clock cycles, all I need to do is inspect the output of the counter. And if the count is zero, that means that puff cell consistently produced a zero in those 64 clock cycles. If the counter is, uh, a counter output is 64, that means it produced a one every single time. And if that count value is close to 32, then it's a cell that's right here in the middle and it produced a, a zero or a one interchangeably with a probability being 50%. Right now, notice that I have, I don't have these as absolute values. It's around zero, around 64 and around 32. Uh, and we'll talk about that, but this is basically majority voting, right? And we call it temporal majority voting because we are doing a majority voting in time. Okay, so what does this look like, right? So we measured this uh, puff array on uh, multiple dies. Uh, so these are showing the values coming out of uh, 12 different dies. And uh, on the left side is the puff ID. So this is the static entropy coming out of the, of the die. And on the right hand, we have a bias map that's telling you where on that bathtub curve each one of these cells are. So if you're on the extremes of the bathtub curve, it's marked as a, a dark pixel. And if you're right in the center of that butterfly, uh, of that bottom curve, then it's a white pixel. And the shades of gray are how far away from that center point are you, right? So the closer, the, the brighter the pixel, the, the you know, the, the, you are at that 50% probability point of a zero and a one. So when we examined uh, a bunch of dyes, what we noticed is um, there, are, there, are, there are plenty of these bright pixels here. But if you look at you know, the perfect pixel, you, now we are looking at whether it's possible to find a perfectly balanced butterfly curve anywhere in this array, right? And what we noticed was, you know, most of the dyes, they, they lack a perfect TRNG cell. You know, out of 12 dyes, only four of them contained at least one perfect TRNG cell. And that is marked here with the blue box, right? So these had, a probability of producing a zero or a one, which was almost at 50%. It was 0.49999 and a whole bunch of nines. Right? So 
the message over here is that you can't take it for granted that, you know, even if you build a really large array, you're going to find one perfect TRNC cell. Uh, it's, 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 uh, so, so we need to do something more sophisticated than just going and searching for this perfect TRNG cell that's producing a count value of 32 if you count it 64 times. So we don't have a perfect TRNG cell, but you'll notice that there are a lot of imperfect TRNG cells here. Right? So we don't, so, or let's call them mediocre TRNG cells. So we don't have a perfect TRNG cells, but we have a whole lot of mediocre TRNG cells. So then the thought was, okay, since we have a lot of mediocre TRNG cells, can we somehow extract the entropy from each one of these mediocre or imperfect TRNG cells and somehow collate the entropies of these multiple TRNG cells that are that individually cannot be used as a TRNG, but if we can distill out the entropy from each one of these TRNG cells, maybe we can produce a, an output which is close to a full entropy output. Right, so, that, so the, the basic idea is we have a, a puff cell, we have a puff array, it can be a 512-bit puff array, and we can now use temporal majority voting to go and examine all the bits in this um, puff array and pick out a handful of these. In this instance, I'm showing, uh, in this example, I'm showing that we pick out four entropy sources. Now, each one of these puff bits, we are going to refer to them as entropy sources, not as puff cells, because they can be used as puffs or TRNGs. So it's a source of entropy. So what we do is we go and find four entropy sources uh, which behave like, uh, you know, as close to a good TRNG as possible, right? So we go and find the four best TRNG cells out there. So they are the cells with counts closest to 32 if we, if we examine them 64 times. Now, what do we do with these four TRNG cells? How do we, um, how do we extract the entropy from them? And that's where we, we go back to this uh, really old entropy extractor um, proposed by uh, von Neumann. Um, it's a pretty simple entropy extractor. All it does is, if you have a raw stream coming in, it compares consecutive bits from the raw bit stream. And it, uh, it's very effective at eliminating bias from uncorrelated bit stream. As long as there's no correlation between consecutive bits, the way it works is, uh, the table on the right shows, illustrates how it works. You take the raw bit stream and you compare consecutive bits, it's looking for transitions in the bits, right? So every time you have a zero to one transition, you put out a one and you throw away the consecutive bits if there is no transition, which is what is happening in the next few cycles. And then when you have a falling transition, a one to zero transition, you put out a zero. So this is kind of converting transitions in the raw bit stream uh, to a one or a zero. And the example over here shows that you know, if you have a bias of 10%, okay, that means you have more ones than zeros over here, it's not perfectly balanced. Um, then, you know, say you're producing a throughput of one every cycle, that you can calculate the entropy per bit as being 0.971. Now, if you examine the output bit stream, now, first thing you'll notice is, is that the throughput really drops. Your throughput falls to 0.24. Right, for a bias of 10%. For one, you, you have a straight loss of 50% loss in, in throughput because you're combining two bits into one bit. And then if you have a bias, you'll have to throw away some of the bits. And so your throughput really drops. So even with 10% bias, which is not unreasonable, uh, you, you, you lose around 76% of your throughput. But the great thing is that your entropy per bit is now one. The output bit stream is going to be totally um, uh, uh, bias free, there's got to be no bias in the output bit stream. Now, the, the monument extractor, so it's a pretty simple monument uh, circuit. It's, you know, some form of an exhaust circuit that you're looking for transitions. Now, in addition, so that is the primary stream. You can also generate what is called a, a residual stream, which uh, now here, we're just looking for transitions, right? So whenever you have a transition, you're putting a rising transition is a one, falling transition is a zero. You can, uh, there is also some entropy contained in the, in, the, in the fact that when is a transition happening, right? The primary stream only encodes up which direction the transition is happening. But if you, if you examine when a transition is happening, 
and convert that to what we call a residual stream. So this uh, transition is happening over here, the zero to one transition, you put out a one. Here there is no transition, so you put out a zero. Again, here there's both the zero to one and a one to zero transition is converted to a one. So the residual stream encodes when a transition is happening. The primary stream encodes what direction the transition was happening. So there's entropy contained in both these streams. There's a lot more entropy contained in the primary stream in the direction of the transition, but there's a decent amount of entropy contained in the, 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 the frequency at which transitions happen. Right? So, so if you look at this uh, bit stream, which had a bias of 10%, uh, the primary stream has zero bias, so it can be directly used for any cryptographic uh, uh, application. The residual stream, you know, it, it, it has a decent amount of uh, entropy. It's 0.9988. This is not good enough for cryptographic applications, but it has a lot less bias than the input bit stream. Now, the nice thing is it has a decent amount of throughput. So now, what can we do with this? Okay, we have a primary stream which is perfect and we have a residual stream which is way better than the input stream, but uh, not perfect. So now what we can do is, if we, if we build up a hierarchical network of these monument extractors um, and say we have these four entropy sources, they are the four best PRNG bits from the array, and we feed these raw bit streams into each into four separate monument extractors. Each one of those extractors will produce a perfect primary stream and an imperfect residual stream. We can take the two residual streams and exhort them together and send them to another monument extractor. So what that will do is it will yet again produce a primary bit stream and a residual bit stream. So it it takes the entropy contained in the residual streams and produces a secondary, a second level of primary stream. And you can go on doing this. So in this case, what we show is with four entropy sources, you can have the first level of monument extractor producing four primary streams, and then two more levels of monument extractors that keep distilling out the amount of entropy contained in the residual streams. So finally, your output bitstream is going to be uh, a concatenation of all the blue arrows over here, right? Because they are the perfect bitstreams. So in effect, what we're doing is we have these four entropy sources and all the blue arrows over here represent, you know, you're distilling out the entropy contained in each one of these entropy sources. Now we can do this because we have multiple uh, imperfect entropy sources and the output bit stream is the collection of all of the entropy contained in these sources. So this is what the unified PRNG and PUF organization looks like. We have an entropy source array, 512 bits. We have a TMV, which identifies which one of these are PUF bits and which one of these can be used as TRNG bits. Right now, the question is, um, I showed four entropy sources over there. Why four? We can go to eight or 16 entropy sources. What's going to happen is uh, your the number of uh, your monument extractors is going to keep growing, or you can go down to two entropy sources where you just have uh, um, three uh, monument extractors and so on. Uh, the target that we had is finally, if you look at the throughput coming out of all those blue arrows, all those primary bit streams, and you collect all of them together, you want a bit per cycle of one. We wanted to generate one random bit, one perfect random bit coming out of that extractor every cycle. Right? And if you want to hit that, uh, you know, the minimum you will need is four entropy sources. And this is based on measurements that we, uh, uh, you know, from a 40 nanometer test chip. So this very much depends on how much entropy is your process is giving you. Right? So, now a few choices here, how, so we have a 512-bit array and we're looking for the four best uh, entropy sources over here that can be used as a TRNG. Now, how do we do that? How do we pick these four, right? There are, now this is where the array organization comes in and you have a lot of choices in how you organize that 512-bit buffer array. One way to do this is you can organize this as a 512 uh, times one um, 
So 512 bits in one column, and you're reading all 512 bits out every cycle. You have 512 uh, TMV counters, and then you have a comparator here, which picks the, the four lowest bias or the, or, or the four biases over here that are closest to 32. Now that's pretty expensive because one, you need 512 counters over here, and then you need a big tree, a comparator tree, which is comparing all of these and picking the, the four lowest ones. Another way to do this is we organize this as a 128 by four array. Then what we can do is we can examine every 128 bit column out at a, uh, uh, at a time. So first we'll examine the first column. We'll pick the four, we'll examine which are the four best in that column. We'll compare it to the four best in the next column and, and so on. That'll allow us to find out which column over here contains the, the best four entropy sources, right? So here we give up some. In this case, we will be picking the four best out of 512. Here we will be picking the four best uh, within a 128-bit window. Now, another option is to do this as a 64 by eight and so on. So there are different ways we can do this. And it turns out that uh, the sweet spot was this 64 by eight organization. So we have eight columns over here. We have eight columns over here, and we have um, uh, 64 cells in each column, and we have 64 counters, and then we have a comparator tree to pick the four best out of these. By doing this, what we showed is that, um, you know, if we go with 64 cells in a column, we lose out on the best four from the entire array, but when we look at the, the, the throughput loss that we incur because we're not picking the best four out of the 512-bit array, it's just a 3% throughput loss. and what we're getting for that is that, you know, instead of 512 bit, uh, 512 counters, we have 64 counters over here, overall much lower area and energy. So you save on 69% in area and 82% in energy savings using this array organization than, you know, going for any of the other ones. Now, we have eight columns over there. Um, now, we need some way of figuring out which is the best column to pick. And it matters which column we pick because here what we show is, so this is measurements from 12 different dice showing that if we at random just picked any column, so that is the, the grayed out bar. So this is showing for each die, if we picked at random any of those eight columns, that is the throughput we'll get. It'll be close to one gigabit per second. If we end up picking uh, the worst column, uh, you lose quite a bit of throughput, around 20% uh, of your throughput. But if you pick the best of those eight columns, you can get a th you can get another you know 15% higher throughput. On average, we saw that you know uh, there is a spread of uh, you know you could get 16% higher throughput if you pick the best column in the array rather than any average column in the array. So motivates us to put in some mechanism over there to go through all those eight columns and pick the array containing the best four TRNG bits. So the way this works is um, we have a, a coarse grain control, which at startup, what we do is, um, so this is the array, the 512 bits organized as a 64 by eight array, and there is a column enabled for each one of these arrays. So first we enable the first column and we read out the first column 64 times into this TMV counter, which counts all 64 incoming bits and converts that to a bias value. We have a comparator tree, which picks the best four, the ones that are closest to 32. So that will take us um, 64 cycles to generate 64 readings of this one column. And it will take us another 63 cycles to do all these comparisons. Okay, so in 128 cycles, we can pick the best out of this one column. Then we move on to the second column and we examine that column to check to see whether it was any better than the column we had earlier examined. If we do, then we swap out, we, we tag the second column as being the best column. So we keep repeating this for, the, for all eight columns. And at the end of 512 cycles, we would have found which column over here contains the best TRNG bits. Now we do this only once. So that is that power up. That is the coarse grain control I mentioned here. So once we do that, and it takes 512, and the plot over here shows the latency of that. It takes 512 cycles to do that. Once we do that, we lock onto that one column, 
Now, within each column, I mentioned that we pick the four best, right? Now, which are the four best is going to change in time, right? Because your voltage is going to bounce around a little bit, your temperature is slowly going to drift. So you want a mechanism to constantly monitor which one of these uh, 64 cells in a column. So which one of these 64 cells in a column you are picking once you've logged into a particular column. And so that is, so we have a separate loop, which is a more fine grained loop, which is running all the time. The coarse grain loop, which column you picked happens once. After that, which four you pick from the column is going to change every cycle. And that is an incremental entropy source substitute. So to illustrate this, we have this, um, this cartoon over here. This, uh, on the, so this is 64 cells in a column arranged in an eight by eight grid, showing what bias is coming out of each one of those cells. So they, as I showed earlier, the cells that are, uh, that are colored white are the ones that we want to go after. The highlighted boxes over here show that at startup, we are going to pick the corner cells and the output of the corner cells are what are shown over here. So this is always producing a zero, this is producing a one, this is producing a zero, producing a one. And this is vertically, if you go, it's, time, uh, the time axis. So it's always producing uh, zero, one, zero, zero. And that's, that's very bad entropy, right? So what happens is um, the moment the, the loop runs, the incremental substitute loop will say that, hey, I'm going to go and pick this cell over here because it contains some amount of randomness. In the next cycle, you would pick this one because that also contains some randomness. Then you pick this one, and then you pick that one. In the meantime, the first cell that you had picked has now gone black, right? So then you pick another cell. So finally, you converge on the white pixels over here that produce a constant random stream, right? So there's a lot more details of this uh, shown uh, in a JSC paper that we had uh, last year, um, showing uh, how we have all these uh, loops that produce, uh, that constantly follow where the entropy is within the array, because that can change with time. And we have this self-calibrating mechanism to react to changes in the environment. Okay, so we can get really good entropies out of this um, extractor. And uh, as indicated by these NIST tests, we pass all the NIST tests and uh, uh, we show that we can produce uh, 1.45 uh, gigabits per second coming out of this uh, or out of this extractor. Another nice thing is because it is uh, capable of self-calibrating, it is resistant to power injection attacks. So if somebody starts modulating the VCC uh, so as to throw this loop out of uh, sync, what will happen is it will, so the red curve is showing, you know, your VCC was at 0.65, you bumped it up to 0.75, you bump it down to 0.55 and so on. Um, if, your, if your loop is enabled, you get the black curve, you know, so you have a throughput that's constantly high. If you, if you break that loop and you disable the loop, then your throughput falls because now you're logged into a cell that uh, is no longer producing good entropy. Okay, we built this in 14 nanometer and uh, showed that uh, we can, at the very uh, least, we can produce 25% uh, area savings over uh, building these separately and uh, a lot more advantages than having separate IP. Right, right so that is how we can go from using separate IP for PUFs and TRNGs to having a unified entropy generator that produces both static IP, a static entropy and dynamic entropy. Okay, so now we have all this entropy, what are we gonna do with it? We would like to encrypt data, right? And we encrypt data by using circuits uh, like AES, which is Advanced Encryption Standard, the most popular symmetric key encryption standard out there. Um, it is, um, it is based on a 128-bit data path. You have a data coming in and you have this encryption key, which is another 128-bit value. And then you do the whole bunch of these um, arithmetic operations on them. And it's an iterative process. In the case of AES-128, you do 10 iterations at the end of which you have a 128-bit ciphertext. Now, the data that you send in is this plain text. The secret data is the round key is the key, which is a 128-bit value. And finally, the ciphertext is the output. Now, an attacker will be, will, can send in data and will be trying to get at what is the secret value that you're using to encrypt the data. Because an attacker has visibility into what the ciphertext is, but doesn't have visibility into what the plain text, what the, what the key is. 
So what people have shown is that, uh, you know, over the past few years, there is a type of attacks called side channel attacks. And these are physical side channel attacks where uh, people uh, realize that by monitoring the current going into the die while an encryption is running, you can now start building correlations of what the um, what switching activity activity is going on in the circuit based on certain key guesses. So you guess at what the key is, and you build a model as to what kind of switching activity you have in the circuit, and you correlate that against the current that's going into the into the device. Now, if your key guess is correct, that correlation is going to be really high. If your key guess is wrong, your correlation is going to be really low. So now you have some way of uh, telling you whether the guess you have made on what the key is, is correct or not. Right? So they figured that you can either monitor the power going into it, or you can monitor the electromagnetic emissions coming out of the die and build all these correlation attacks. And um, one example we're showing over here is, um, so this is the current, um, so the, 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 these are the main blocks in, in AES. And uh, the current going into the, the, these are the current traces. These are actual current traces that we captured from the supply current, go, uh, supply current that we probed uh, on a point on the board close to the die. And what we, what we build is we build these correlation models and plotted them against the number of traces. So with one encryption, it's not, you know, again, this, this is a statistical thing. So we're trying to build correlation models and with the more number of data that we can feed this model, the more, uh, accurate you get. Now, what is shown over here in, uh, you have a lot of curves over here. So the gray curves are the incorrect key guesses and the black curve is the correct key guess. And what we saw was, and people have reported this multiple times that, you know, in around 10,000 encryptions, we will be, the, the correct key guess will begin to stick out and separate itself from this bundle of incorrect key guesses. And that tells you that, hey, this is the correct key that's being used for encryption. Now this is, you attack this one byte at a time, so it's an eight bit value, so there are 256 key guesses here. And um, so 255 of them are bundled up in this gray and the correct one is sticking out. Okay, so this is uh, quite alarming because at this point, you know, somebody can just send in data into the, uh, into your uh, AES uh, hardware and uh, um, take a guess at what the key is, examine whether the correlation model is, uh, telling you whether this is a good key or a bad key. And then pretty much in um, um, in, in, in like uh, 160,000 traces, you'll get all 16 key bytes out, right? Now, the reason this is happening is because there is correlation between the switching activity on die and the actual key that is being used for encryption. And whether it is EM or whether it is power, that's those are different ways this correlation is being sent out. It, so how do we do, how do we get around this? There are different ways we can get around this. And one technique I'd like to talk about over here is fundamentally you have to either, you have to break that correlation. Break the correlation between the, um, between the switching activity on die and the key being used. Now that can be done two ways. Either you can make that correlation, um, you can break that correlation by making sure that no matter what key is being used, that current trace is a flat line, right? So there is no correlation in that case. Or you can make sure that the signal to noise ratio of that, uh, of, the, of that correlation is way below the noise floor. In which case you can, um, you can make sure that it's going to take that act a really large number of uh, traces. And if you can make that impractical, now suddenly you're mounting the, the cost of the attack is going up uh, significantly. Right, so the, the technique I'd like to focus on is this, the one that marked in red over here called the heterogeneous S-box. So um, a few things about the arithmetic that's being used in, the, in, in AES. AES, as I mentioned before, I'll go back a few slides, um, uses a 128-bit data path where the data path is organized as 16 bytes. And each one of these bytes implements a Galois field arithmetic um, and the actual uh, arithmetic that's being computed over here is you're computing the inverse in the Galois field. So for an 8-bit number coming in, and the Galois field is this uh, GF2 to the 8 um, uh, field. 
And so for every 8-bit input coming over here, you're computing an output such that the product of the two will give you a one, right? So it's an inverse operation that you're computing over here. That is the most uh, uh, compute intensive uh, part of this entire process. So what does that uh, look like when you break it down into circuits? It looks like a, a block like that. You have you have eight bit multipliers. You have you have these uh, blocks which uh, which compute the square and multiplication with some uh, constant. You have an inverse computation. You have uh, what is a matrix multiplication and so on. Now there's a lot of details about the Galois field arithmetic here being used over here, but um, the main thing I would like to point out is that uh, there are a pair of Galois field um, polynomials that are, that pretty much define the arithmetic that's being used in this computation. And a lot of these polynomial coefficients factor into the actual implementation. So for example, there's an extension field polynomial which has an alpha and a beta term, and those are the constants being used over here. And similarly, there is this ground field polynomial, and based on this ground field polynomial, uh, based on the values of A0, A1, A2, and A3, these transformations that are applied on the output are going to change quite a bit. So the point is that, you know, based on the, the, the polynomial used, your circuit realization can be quite different. And it turns out that there are 2,880 choices of polynomials. You can use any of these polynomials for this arithmetic. And in the past, everybody used this one polynomial that was defined a long time back in a math paper. Um, what we did is we went and explored all these 2,880 polynomials and figured out what is the impact on the actual circuit implementation. So what, what ends up happening is your circuit looks very different depending on what polynomial you've used. I've just taken an example of two polynomials over here and showing how the squaring and beta term changes, your multiplication with the constant changes. In this case, there is it's just simple wiring, whereas here you're using four XORs, uh, three XORs, and so on. So what that translates to is if you look at the power consumption of the circuits designed using this polynomial versus that polynomial, it can be quite different. This this uh, scatter plot over here shows with different polynomials. So we have 160 different polynomials here. Uh, based on this one, which polynomial you used, you can have almost a 2x spread in your current consumption for the same input, right? So what this allows you to do now is that, as I mentioned, um, we have 16 different bytes here. Instead of using the same polynomial for every byte, if we use a different polynomial for each one of these bytes, and instead, when the data comes in, instead of having a predictive data flow through these each one of these bytes, if we randomize which byte goes into which byte slice, you're going to see for the same input, you're going to, see, and this is randomized at runtime. So you'll have a TRNG in here that, um, that, that you know, with some muxes channeling which byte is going into which byte slice. Now, the same data is going to see a very different power consumption, very different switching activity on die based on what the data flow is. So to illustrate that over here, one example is we're just showing two adjacent bytes. The data can be going straight through or it can be swizzled and then going through, right? So you're gonna see very different uh, current signatures based on exactly what kind of outing you have on the die. And uh, I'm gonna jump ahead in the interest of time to leave some time for questions. Uh, this, is, this is the result. So uh, once we turn on this randomization, mm -hmm. then what happens is that mm -hmm. uh, you have uh, the, the correct key guess is buried well within all the incorrect key guesses. There's a seven X reduction in the correlation coefficient, you know, uh, compared to an unprotected AES, right? And uh, further details about um, further ways of illustrating the same data. But basically what we've done is we've broken the correlation or we've lowered the signal to noise of the, of the, of the information leaking from this. Okay. I'm going to skip over the next few foils, but uh, talking about the other portions of the circuit, I just talked about one of the main portions of the circuit and illustrate how we can use arithmetic techniques and bring in randomization on die to break this correlation. And there's a lot more details in our JC paper that we just uh, published earlier uh, this year. And uh, this was presented at BLSI Symposium last year.
right? So with that, let me, so again, we, we built this in 14 nanometer and uh, uh, we showed that uh, there is there is an area overhead for this, right? So I mentioned that we, we put in some multiplexes over there to channel the bytes into the appropriate byte slice. We have an LFSR in there to produce the random bits that uh, control the selects of all those multiplexes. Uh, so there's a 28% area overhead for this technique. But compared to all the existing techniques, the, the best known technique for uh, reducing uh, correlation is this technique called random masking, which has a 100% area overhead. Today, if you, look, if you go and buy IP, which is a SCA resistant AES, it will be at least 100% area overhead compared to an unprotected AES. This one has one third the area overhead of that technique uh, while giving you um, an MTD. And this is the minimum time to disclosure um, of uh, at least uh, three orders of magnitude higher okay, without impacting throughput and, and performance. Okay, um, so with that, let me summarize. So we just looked at uh, a lightweight uh, side channel attack resistant AES uh, with three orders of magnitude improvement in uh, resistance over an unprotected design uh, with um, uh, almost an order of uh, magnitude reduction in correlation. And this is after doing 12 million uh, encryptions. So an unprotected one would uh, give you all 16 bytes in around 100,000 encryptions. This one even after 12 million encryptions, there was no leakage and area overhead and power overhead that's shown here. And before that, we looked at a unified entropy generator uh, using a hierarchical volume and extractor uh, to produce both POPs and TRNGs from a single design. All right, so with those were the two topics that I wanted to cover in the tutorial. Uh, I had to rush through some of the, um, the side channel resistant AES. So if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to take them in the remaining few minutes. Uh, or if you can, uh, if you have uh, uh, questions beyond that, I can. I'll be happy to detain them over email.